We often buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. That's a Dave Ramsey is. Uh, and it often, in my mind, sums up the money problem in American society. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. You see this every day. You cannot pull up to a stoplight in any town and not look over at the vehicle next to you and wonder what he was thinking once in a while. You're like, mm, you know. Uh, I kid you not, I was at an event not too long ago, and I heard, uh, I overheard a group of ladies talking about a gentleman pulled up to a, uh, an event that they were all at, and they had been talking about this particular guy, and, oh, you really need to meet him, he's cute, and this, that, and the other, and, like, he's a bit of a not nice person, uh, not my words, and theirs were a little bit more colorful than that, like, he pulls up, he's driving a gigantic vehicle, super large pickup truck. It's jacked up, got big knobby tires. The guy gets out of it, he comes up to just about, just above the bottom of the door. Uh, like, oh. And they all joked about, what's he compensating for? Like, not my joke. I just overheard. Like, but the fact of the matter is, like, my question is, what did he pay for his truck? Because I'm nosy like that. Uh, I have been a part of many churches over the last 25 years and served on, with a number of churches and served as a, a lay member. Um, there is no topic that probably gets less treatment than money. Like, now, I will say, I have been in a church where the guy talked about the tithes and offerings every single week. So he preached Y'all need to be giving your tithes and offerings every single week. Now, he didn't actually talk about money other than to make sure that they were, we're, we're hyping that up, that, that we're, we're talking about the money. And frankly, there are lots of churches, I'm wearing a Baptist church, there are lots of Baptist churches that still pass the offering plate every Sunday, and that's where we kind of talk about money. We ask people for money, we, we pass the plate around. Um, if you're, you're not, you're just visiting, we don't do that here. Okay, so we don't pass the plate on Sundays. Um, we do collect money. There's a little tiny box in the back of the room. Why don't we talk about money? Like, in church. Well, because it makes people uncomfortable. Like, if you... There are few things that make people madder than when you start talking about how they ought to spend their hard-earned money. Like, they get all sorts of squeamish. You know? And if you happen to drive a truck with big tires, you're like, he's already talking about me. <laughs> he's in the introduction. Like, look, I had a truck with big tires once, okay? I mean, I have committed all of these atrocities. Um, like... No, like, but what I would like to do over the next few weeks is we're going to take money and deal with it very super practically. Like, today, as the introductory sermon, we're going to talk about it a little bit more theoretically. We're going to talk about the philosophy behind why we handle our money a certain way. And then we're actually going to talk a little bit about the how-tos. Um, now, if you're friends of mine, y'all all know I'm a Dave Ramsey person, okay? So we did, we, my wife and I are deeply indebted. No, we are free of debt, but we are uh, emotionally indebted. I don't know this brother, but it was, we owe him a lot because uh, we, in our first year of marriage, we took Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University because uh, as a young guy, I knew absolutely, I was, I was a young, I was 28 years old, okay? When we got married, I was 28, uh -huh. Everything that I owned fit in a Toyota Camry. I mean, I had lived paycheck to paycheck since college. Like, I didn't owe any money to anybody, but I also owned nothing except a 1993 Toyota Camry called the Smoking Bandit. All right, that was all I owned. And, you know, everything that I could wedge in it. A guitar, a bag of clothes. Okay. Um, but I didn't have anything either. And so we had this whole conversation, even going into marriage, but I didn't know much about personal finance. I basically got the money, and I spent it. That was pretty much my understanding of how money worked. Um, I did not learn about money or how to handle it from my parents. I love mom and dad, but they didn't teach me. I didn't learn it in school. Uh, and we didn't have a class that actually taught financial sense in school. I didn't learn about it in, in school. I didn't, I was a physics major in college, 
So in my first degree is in physics. Guess what? There are no requirements in the physics degree that you take anything on personal finance. And I didn't. So, I mean, I took lots of math. I mean, I understand compound interest exceedingly well. But I didn't actually know anything about how to handle money. I couldn't. I mean, my wife still jokes that right before we got married, she balanced my checkbook just to see if I actually had any money she was getting into. Um, and I was within, what, about $5 of bouncing a check. She says, no, I would have bounced a check if I didn't shift some money around. So I, I would have actually bounced a check right before we got married. Now, I, don't, I never, ever, ever have bounced a check. But I would have probably bounced one because we were writing out more money than I had. Okay, all of that to say, that's kind of a long introduction to say, what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of the, the why we handle our money a certain way. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, as it turns out, Jesus talks about money quite a bit. It's one of his... Hot topics. It's kind of one of the strange things that we don't as pastors talk about it that much. Uh, we talk an awful lot about giving, so I'll throw that out there. A lot of times pastors talk a lot about you need to give, you need to give, you need to give. Um, a wise old lady told me you can't get blood from a turnip. Uh, you cannot get blood from a turnip. You cannot get money from people who have none. Like, and uh, if you if you are in your eyeballs. In debt, up to your eyeballs in debt. Like, it's exceedingly difficult to give to the church to give to the things of God. It just is, because you, trust me, you've got to pay the lenders first or they come get your stuff. I've been on, I've been a part of a church that borrowed a gazillion dollars from the bank to buy, a build a big new church building uh, because they had some ungodly leadership. Okay, they had a group of men who were deacons in the church who were not godly men. They've all left, as it turns out, and they've all demonstrated their true colors at this point. They were uh, they made some decisions about borrowing money that didn't make any sense, and that church almost sunk because they borrowed so much money to build their church building they couldn't afford to pay anybody. Couldn't afford to pay the pastor or the staff people or give to missions. It almost sunk the church. They had to redo their entire church budget, and they have scraped by until. They are finally starting to manage 10 years later. Okay, um, but Borrowing money is a dangerous thing. Jesus talks a lot about money. and We're going to start in Matthew chapter 6, which is the Sermon on the Mount. So a tidbit of background because I'm diving into the middle. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is primarily moral teachings. And it's basically Jesus teaching the Ten Commandments. And Jesus is raising the bar on the Ten Commandments. You've heard it said, but I say to you. So Jesus is taking kind of the spirit of the law and raising the bar a little bit. And so in Matthew chapter 6, he's going to deal with money. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, he deals with giving to the poor. He says, verse six, chapter 6, verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites in the synagogues do and in the streets they do, so that you may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. When you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Okay, so... Jesus begins his conversation about money with talking about giving. In particular, in this context, he's talking about charitable giving and giving to the poor. Like, and we've all observed someone whose name is on the side of a building in memory because his foundation gave umpteen million dollars to build this building for the poor. Like, he has his reward in full. Okay, like his reward is being the fam being the famous guy for having his name on the side of the building because he funded this children's home, children's hospital thing that he's he's funding the poor. Okay, and we've if you've been around people long enough, you you'll occasionally meet this guy, and you're starting to have a conversation about uh, if things turn to finances or they'll turn to his work. And he'll start telling you about all the causes that he gives to. Well, we give to this, and we give to that, and we give to this, and we give to that. Or, we just gave $500,000 to this charity. Like, okay, when that guy does that, okay, he's doing it for you to go, wow, what a great guy you are. 
What a great person you are. Like, he's giving publicly for public recognition. And Jesus says, don't do that. This is not black, this is black and white. Okay? Jesus says, don't do that. Like, that, that, let your Father in heaven reward what is done in secret. This means that the best way to give is anonymously. Now, we're in the 21st century, nothing is completely anonymous. Like, if I cut a check to the church, guess what? Somebody's going to cash it. You know, like, our, little, our money people are going to go, woo, the preacher gave some money. Like, you can't give completely anonymously. Oh, that's not true. It's difficult to give completely anonymously in the 21st century. There's nothing wrong with writing a check to the church that has your name on it. Like, what we're talking about is going, trumpeting your own horn. Guess what? I got a bonus this week, so I'm giving an extra $50 to the Benevolence Fund on your way to the little black box. Okay, don't do that. Okay, the little black box is how we give. There's a little black box in the back of the room. Like, or, uh, okay, if you're in a church that passes the offering plate, or if we ever pass it, put the check face down. You ever been next to that guy? He put the check face up because he wanted you to know how much he wrote it for. I don't care, dude. I really don't. That's between you and God. Like, but there are people who do that. They put the check. I'm going to put $250 for this one. I'm going to put it face up. Like, don't do that. Okay, that, Jesus says, when you give, give in secret. Which means, don't make a big deal out of it. Um, continuing on. He talks about prayer in the next section. And don't pray in public. Uh, like the hypocrites do. Like, for human recognition. Uh, for sake of time, we're going to skip down where he talks about fasting in verse 16. And he says, when you fast, fast means don't eat for a period of time for a specific purpose. When you fast, don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Same concept here. Like in all three of these texts, it's all about like, let God be the one that rewards you. Don't toot your own horn. Like fasting is an important spiritual discipline that we will come back to uh, at some point. Uh, but the idea here is don't practice your righteousness in front of people. Like, don't handle your money in front of people. Don't pray in front of people so that they like... Man, he, he prayed with an awful lot of big words. I mean, my kids have said that to me. That guy prayed with a lot of big words. Like, pray in a way that the people who are in your hearing can pray along with you. Um, crack up, though, because my four-year-old often prays that, God, this food will be the nourishment of our bodies. He has no idea what nourishment means, but that's Papa's words that he uses it. So. Like, don't pray with big words. Pray with words that the people around you understand. Don't fast so that people love you and go, oh man, he's so holy and righteous. Incidentally, the monks disregarded this. Now, on to money. Verse 19. This is where I want to land. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This verse is oft quoted. It's on little signs in people's houses, uh, at least the latter part. Sometimes we skip the first and we just put the, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also up. Uh, and we skip the, wait a minute, we're actually talking about money. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth nor rust don't. Uh, and where thieves don't break in and steal. Like, so we had a fun conversation about this in, in, in Sunday school with the little ones, asking them, okay, what, is, what does it mean to store up? Store up means to gather in, right? We, we, we store up. The, the idea is you have a big fat bank account, and you pile as much money into it as possible. 
And the warning here is, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why not? Because moth and rust destroy them. Like, how many of you have seen a car from the 1950s that wasn't running? What's it look like? It's a rust heap in somebody's yard. Like, and it takes a heck of a lot of work and a lot more money to get that thing up and running. Like, because what's going to happen, how many of you have been, walked through a house that's at least 100 years old? I, mean, I got a friend who lives in one of those. Like, it's always falling down around him. Bless his heart. Like, it's crumbling because it's 100 years old. Like, the reality of time is that we live in a world where moth and rust destroy. And everything goes back to dust eventually. Like, and my very astute daughter said, gold doesn't get corrupted, Dad. She's right. Gold doesn't. Gold stands the test of time. It can sit on the sea floor as sunken pirate treasure for 1,000 years, 500 years, pull it back up, shine it off, it's just as shiny. Guess what? That's why the second half of the verse is there. Because thieves break in and steal that. No, it doesn't get corrupted in this life, but someone can break in and steal it. And I said, well... We were having a conversation where we've never actually been broken into. Like This is the 21st century, and we are blessed that no one has actually broken into our house and tried to steal anything. Um, and she looks at me, she says, but didn't somebody steal your credit card, Dad? <laughs> yes, she's right. Like, 21st century, someone tried, I, apparently someone stole my credit card and bought a Traeger grill earlier this summer. Uh, I didn't know what a Traeger grill was or how much they cost until I bought one on my credit card. Um, no, I didn't actually buy it. We had to go through the process of disputing the charges and talking to the people at Visa. And they're like, you don't know anyone in South Dakota? No, ma'am, I don't know anyone in South Dakota. Like, thieves are always trying to steal your money. Like, and sometimes they get it. Like, this is, the, the reality is... The money that we have in this life is temporary. And that's the whole idea here, is that when you pile up treasures on earth, like you buy a fancy schmancy car, in 10 years that fancy schmancy car is pain in the butt that you're just trying to keep rolling because the bearings don't work like they used to and it, it, they, don't, they don't operate at the same level. I used to sell used cars, um, the public shaming here. So I used to sell used cars once upon a time. I learned an awful lot through that experience. Um, but one of the things that I often observed is people would come in, A, if you buy a new car, it is worth three to $4,000 less than you paid for it the moment it hits the curb. Okay? Drive it off the parking lot, you drop four grand in value right then. Boop, gone. Uh, it just is. So if you buy a $30,000 vehicle, the moment you drive it off the parking lot, it's worth twenty six. dollars just so you know, four grand out the window just for driving it out of the parking lot. Uh, now, if you buy a used one that someone came back and traded in or whatever and you bought a $27,000 vehicle with 10,000 miles on it, it's probably worth twenty six. Okay, it, it, You don't have the same drop buying a nicer used car. Like, but we often have people come into the dealership and we sit down and we look at their finances because they don't have much money. Like, and that's why they're coming to see us. They're trying to figure out, i got to have a car to get to work. I mean, I understand that. I'm like, okay, talk, let's talk about the money side. And they go, okay, I've got, we look at all their numbers, and like, you can afford if you manage your money well, which they don't, but if you do. Okay, if you, if you do manage your money well, you can afford a $350 car payment. Like, you can make that work. It will not bankrupt you. You can, you can make a $350 a month car payment. Uh, you're going to have to not spend too much money going out to eat and other things, but you can do this. Like, and we go, okay, so I start showing them the cars that I can sell them for a $350 a month payment. And you can imagine what happened next. But I don't want this car. I want that one. That is not a $350 a month car payment, my friend. But that's the car I want. It doesn't matter. You can't have it. You don't have enough money. Like, the math here is simple. If you buy that car, it's going to cost you $520 a month for the next 72 months, and you don't have that kind of money. But that's what I want. You are storing up for yourselves treasures on earth. You are valuing things that don't matter. 
a very critical lesson I learned working on the parking, working at the car lot was from a little old black guy, very nice little guy who had been in car sales forever. Okay, so he's in his 60s, he's about to retire, but he's, his entire life he's been a used car salesman. Um, and he drove a 20-year-old Nissan Sentra, rust all down the thing. Um, it was a beater of beaters. I mean, I felt, I felt good parking next to him because I was driving a smoking Toyota Camry, you know, driving to, to the car lot. Like, we were selling hot, new and used Hondas. And, uh, and I asked, I said, tell me why you drive a 20-year-old Nissan Sentra. And he said, one thing I have learned about cars, young man, is that they all fall apart eventually. And that a car is a mode of transportation. It gets me from home to here and back. That's all it does. He said, the car that, that, that I want to show to people and show off, he said, I don't ever drive it. He said, I, got, he said, I, no, I kid you not. He said, I drive it to church on Sundays. He said, I, that's a fact. <laughs> he got a brand new Mercedes sitting in the garage at the house that he drives to church on Sundays. But his daily driver is a beater Sentra that he drives back and forth because cars get you from point A to point B. But and we live in the 21st century and people still haven't figured that out because they go spend a gazillion dollars on a car payment that they really can't afford. Now we'll get to the how do you figure that out in a different sermon. I promise we're going to circle back to the how do you know what you can afford. But I want to see here. Like what is he talking about? Don't store up treasures on earth. The greatest idol in the Schrader household that we talk about often, that the regular part of our conversation is comfort. Like, I, the idea that I just want to be comfortable. Like, you know, we pray for the middle. Lord, don't make me so wealthy that I forget you, and don't make me so poor that I have to steal for bread. That's Ecclesiastes. Like, and we pray for the middle. Lord, let, keep us humble and aware of where our provision comes from. Like, but frankly, we've been in the middle for a long time, and sometimes the middle is really comfortable. Lord, I just want to be comfortable. And that's an honest assessment. I want to be comfortable. Like, and in, that comf in, the, in the pursuit of a comfortable life, what we end up with is functioning like wealthy people in the sense that we don't give as much as we could give because we're driving a vehicle that's nicer than what we need. Or we're living in a house that's bigger than what we need. Or we are going on an excursion that cost... Look, I took my kids to Disney World last year. I want you to be aware. Like, I've done that. I'm, 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 like, you know what it cost to take them? Like, I, it took us a year to save the money to go to Disney World because the stinkers cost $100, over $100 a day per ticket. Like... Disney World's an expensive vacation, just so you understand. We only went to Disney for three days. Uh, but we saved for a year so that we could take our kids and do the Disney thing. Like, I believe in investing in memories, not in stuff. Like, I, I believe in, like, the best marital advice that I ever got given before we got married was invest in memories, not in stuff. The stuff will take care of itself. Like, when Jesus is talking about don't store up treasures for yourself on earth, He's talking about all the physical stuff that falls apart, breaks, and wanes. Like, and he does say, the counter to that is store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where no, they don't rot, they don't rust, and they don't, no one steals them. Now, let me ask you this. Worked hard all week, got your paycheck. Can you just run up to heaven and drop it off? Lord, I'm going to store my treasure here. Take care of the money. And run back down? Like, no, it doesn't work that way. The kids all got a good laugh out of them. They're like, no, you can't just run up to the throne room of God and drop the money off. Hey, he's not a bank. He doesn't operate like a banker. Like, the Lord has called us to be good stewards of the money he's given us. And so, what kind of treasure do we store in heaven? Like, you can't go drop your money off there. So what kind of treasures are we called to store up? Like, this is actually fairly simple if you do the math. 
Like, what lasts forever? The kids were like, Jesus? All right, they're paying attention. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Okay, the, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are, they are forever. What else is forever? People, the souls of men and women and children. The only thing that's eternal in this life is, is the God that we worship and the souls of men. So how do we store up the souls of men? Like, we invest in others. Like, in the 21st century, the greatest commodity is not money. We got lots of that if we're really honest with ourselves. The greatest commodity is time. Because time is the one thing none of us can make more of. Like, if we run out of money, I can make more. Like, there is, there is work available. We can go produce more income. What there is not, I can't. I got 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's all God gave me. That's it. And God decided that was enough. Time is my greatest commodity. Do I spend my time focused on making money by which I store up treasures on earth? Or do I spend my time focused on building relationships with people whose souls are eternally valuable? That's the heart of the matter. That's the heart of this text. Are you investing in people? Are you talking to your friends and family members about Christ? Like, I get that it's scary. Like, I, I promise you, I've been there. I've offended my share of people talking to them about Jesus because they didn't want to hear it. But the fact of the matter is the only thing that lasts forever are the souls of men. And if we're going to store up treasures in heaven, the way that we do that is by storing up the souls of our friends and family members as we talk to them about Jesus and share the hope that we have in him. That's it. Thank you. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Like, if we are constantly focused on producing earthly wealth, making more money, chasing the next dollar, if that's our focus, like, we can't possibly focus on building relationships with lost people. We can't focus on building relationships with our family members that don't know Christ yet, with our neighbors that don't know Christ yet. Because at the end of the day, i got 24 hours, and I'm going to either invest in working, like, or working a second job, or working a third job. Like, there have been times in our marriage where I had three. Like, and, or I'm going to invest it in figuring out how do I spend time with people? How do I spend time building relationships with this person? And then not just hanging out with them, but being intentional about the conversation so that they have an opportunity to hear about Christ. Because if you think that just because we live in the buckle of the Bible Belt that people around you know Jesus, you are sorely misinformed. Because there are an awful lot of people that went to a vacation Bible school when they were a kid, prayed a prayer, think that they're good for life. But they have no idea what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do in them, how the Holy Spirit is going to transform them into the image of Christ. They don't have any idea. They've never been discipled, they've never been taught, they love the things that the world loves, and you couldn't tell them from a non you couldn't tell a non-Christian from someone who says they're a Christian most of the time. Like, we are called with our money, first and foremost, to value people. Like, and we'll get into the how that works in terms of giving in a future sermon. Jesus ends this parable. Or this, this teaching in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. You can't serve them both. Like, and this is super hard in America because we have more opportunity to build wealth than any other culture in the history of the world. Like, we have more opportunity here, whether it's through education, which is everywhere and available, or through just hard work and ingenuity and entrepreneurship. Like, we have more opportunity than ever before to build wealth. Like, 
And there's nothing wrong with building wealth. Uh, there's nothing wrong with building wealth if it has its place. If the other things are in place as well. Like, God doesn't call us to a life of poverty. So, uh, like, don't get me wrong. There's an awful lot of preachers that I know that feel, think, feel like God made them take a vow of poverty. Like, and he didn't. Like, God hasn't called us to a life of poverty. Like, and there's nothing wrong with building a nest egg, a saving, saving for retirement, those types of things. Those are all part of the healthy financial plan. Like, the issue is where is your heart? Is your security in the pile of money that you're saving? Or is your security in Christ? Is your time being most invested in piling up the money and thinking about the things that you can do on your days off to go play? Or are you thinking about how you can build relationships with your neighbors? How you can build relationships with lost people? How you can invite non-Christians into your world so that you can share the hope that you have in Christ? Because at the end of the day, it's not the dollars and cents that matter. It's the heart. Like, this is the same issue for adults that we teach in our parenting stuff. At the end of the day, where's my heart? Where my treasure is, there my heart will be also. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you have drawn us out of darkness into your marvelous light. That you use the light of the gospel to expose sin in our lives and things that we love more than you. Lord, I pray that this week you would be exposing areas of our lives as we look at our finances where we love money more than you or where we love the things that money buys more than you. Lord, I pray that as we grow in our faith, you would align our values with yours. Lord, you love the souls of men more than anything else. And for that, we are exceedingly grateful because we have been bought with a price. And Lord, I pray that you would disciple us, that you would teach us to love what you love and to love the souls of men. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.